Tales from the Future, School or Lesson of the Gods, from the book by Vladimir Legros, Co-Creation, translated by Marion Schwartz. I saw as if looking down among many parcels of land, one that was different from all the others, and its inner layout. In it, there were several large wooden buildings connected by path lines, with different flower beds. Next to the set of structure was, was a natural amphitheater, a knoll where rows of benches descended from top to bottom in a semicircle, and where about 300 people of different ages were sitting. Among them were older people with gray and their hair and people who were quite young. They seemed to be sitting in families. Since grown men, women, and children of different ages sat hig higgly piggly. Everyone was talking to everyone else excitedly as if they were about to see something unusual, a superstar concert or president spe presidential speech. On a wooden stage up front were two little tables, two chairs, and a large blackboard in back. Next to the platform was a group of children, 15 or so, ranging in age from five to 12, and engage in lively debate about something. There is something like a Cygnosium or astronomy about to begin. I heard Anastasia's voice. Why are the children here? Didn't their parents have anyone to leave them with? I asked Anastasia. One of them from the group of debating children is just about to give the main report. They're still choosing, choosing who this will be. See, there are two candidates, a boy nine years old and a girl of eight. Now the children are voting. <clears throat> the majority chose the boy. A business-like little boy approached the table with a confident step. He took some papers with plans and drawings out of a manila folder and laid them on the table. All the children either gradually walked or skipped along to join their parents sitting on the benches. The red-haired, freckle-faced little girl, the other candidate for the speech, walked past the table with a proudly raised head. She was holding a bigger and thicker folder than the boy. There were probably drawings and plans in that folder too. The boy by the table tried to say something to the girl candidate walking by, but the child didn't stop. She straightened her red braid and walked past. Turning away demonstratively, for a while the boy watched, distraught as the proud red-haired child moved away. Then he again began to set out his pages with great concentration. Who taught, thought these, who taught these children astronomy so well that they can give a report to adults? I asked Anastasia. No one taught them, she replied. It was suggested to them that they themselves figure out how it is all arranged and then prepare and present their conclusions. They have been preparing for more than two weeks and now the important moment has come. Their conclusions can be opposed by anyone who wants to, and they will defend their opinion. So this is like a game. You could call what is going on a game, but it is a very serious game. Each person present will engage and accelerate his thought about the planetary arrangement and perhaps will begin to think about something bigger. After all, the children have been thinking for two weeks, contemplating and their thinking, 
is not limited by any dogmas. They do not have any present interpretations of the planetary arrangement hang over them, hanging over them. We still do not know what they will come out with. We still do not know what they will come out with. Do you mean to say that they will dream up something with their childish intellect? I mean to say they will present their theory. The adults do not have axioms of the planetary arrangement either, after all. The goal of the symposium is not to work out any canons, but to accelerate thought, which subsequently will determine the truth or come close to it. A young man walked up to the second little table and announced at the beginning of the report. The boy began to speak. He spoke confidently and enthusiastically for 25 or 30 minutes. His speech seemed to me total childish fantasy, a fantasy not based on any scientific theories or even the elementary knowledge of a high school astronomy course. The boy said approximately the following. If you look at the sky at night, there are a whole lot of stars shining there. There are different kinds of stars. There are very little stars and bigger ones. But the very little stars can be big too. We only think they're little at first, but they are very big. Because when an airplane flies high up, it's little. But when we go up to it, to it on the ground, it looks big. And lots of people can fit inside it. Each star could fit a lot of people, only there aren't any people in the stars right now, but they shine at night. The big ones shine, the big ones shine, and so do the little ones. They shine so that we will look at them and think about them. The stars want us to do everything as well on them as on earth. They envy the earth a little. They want the same kinds of berries and trees to grow on them as we have and to have the same kind of strings and little fish. The stars are waiting for us and each is trying to shine so that we notice it. But we still can't fly to them because we have a lot to do at home. But when we finish up everything at home and everywhere, and things are fine, all over the earth, we'll fly to the stars. Only, we won't fly on a plane or a rocket, because it takes a long time to fly in a plane, and it's long and boring on a rocket. Also, not everyone will fit on a plane or rocket, and rocket won't hold all kinds of freight. And trees won't fit or restrain. When we've made everything all over the earth good, we, the whole earth, will fly to the first star. A few other stars will want to fly to earth themselves and press up to it. They've already sent us little bits, and their little bits have pressing up to the earth. At first, people thought these were comets, but these are bits of stars that want very much to press up to the beautiful earth. They were sent by the stars that are waiting for us. We can fly up to a distant stars as the whole earth. And whoever wants to can, whoever wants to can stay on the star so that it would be handsome there like on earth. The boy lifted his pages and showed them to his listeners. On the pages were drawings of the starry sky and trajectories of the earth movements toward the stars. In the last drawing, two stars bloom in garden and gardens and earth moved away from them in this intergalactic flight. When the boy finished speaking and showing his drawings, the moderator announced that whoever wanted to could speak 
as an opponent or express his own ideas regarding what he had heard. But no one was in any hurry to speak. Everyone was silent. And it seemed to me, agitated of some re- for some reason. Why are they so agitated? I asked Anastasia. Do none of the adults know astronomy? They're agitated because you need to bring good arguments and speak coherently. After all, their children are present. If a speech is, an, is incomprehensible or unacceptable to a child's soul, mistrust will arise toward the speaker, or even worse, dislike. The adults treasure the regard for them and are agitated and don't want to take a risk. They're afraid of looking mean in front of those gathered, and most of all, in front of their own children. The heads of many of those present began turning in the direction of an elderly, graying man sitting in the middle of the hall. He had his arms around the shoulders of a little red-headed girl, the one who was one of the candidates for the report. Next to them sat a young and very pretty woman, Anastasia commented. Many are now looking at the graying man in the middle of the hall. He is a university professor, a scientist. He is retired now. At first, his private life didn't work out, and he had no children. Ten years ago, he took a parcel of land and began setting it up himself. A young woman came to love him. And they had this little red-haired girl. The young woman next to him is his wife and the mother of his daughter. The former professor loves his late child very much. The red-haired girl, his daughter, regards him with great respect and love. Many of those present believe that the professor should speak first. But the graying professor was slow to speak. It was obvious he was drumming a magazine out of agitation. Finally, the professor rose and began to say something about the structure of the universe, comets, and the Earth's mass. Finally, he concluded, the planet Earth, of course, does move in space and rotates, but it is indissolubly linked with the solar system and cannot move toward distant galaxies independently without the solar system. The sun gives life to every living thing on earth. Moving away from the sun would mean its significant significant cooling on earth and as a consequence the planet's death. We can all observe what happens even when we move to relatively short wave from the sun. Winter happens. The professor suddenly fell silent. The boy speaker was going through his drawings, this draw, then looking inquiringly at his classmates with whom he had prepared his speech. But evidently, the argument about winter and cooling was very weighty and understandable to everyone. This argument destroyed a pretty childish dream of coming flight. Suddenly, in the silence that followed, which had already lasted half a minute, the graying professor voice was heard again. Winter, life always dies down if the earth does not have enough solar energy. Always. No scientific theoretical investigations are needed to see this. To be convinced. However, it may be that the earth itself has the same kind of energy as the sun, but it just hasn't shown itself. No one has discovered it yet. Maybe you will one day. Maybe the earth can be self sufficient. This energy will manifest itself in something. The sun's energy will manifest on earth 
and like solar energy, it will unfold the flower, the flower's petals. And when we can travel on earth through the galaxy, but then the professor broke off and fell silent. A murmur of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction arose in the hall and it began. Adults rose from their seats to refute the professor. When it came to the possibility of living without the sun, they said something about planet photosynthesis, about the temperature of the environment, about the trajectories of the movement of the planets, which no one planet can, ex can exit. Pro the professor sat, dropping his graying head lower and lower. His red-headed daughter turned her head to face the speaker and sometimes rose slightly as if she wanted to defend her father from his opponents with her body. An elderly woman who looked like a teacher took the floor and began talking about how bad it is to indulge in flatter children for the sake of their self-esteem. Any lie will be exposed in time. And then how are we all going to look? This is not simply a lie, it's a cowardice, the woman said. The red-haired girl latched onto the lapels of her father's jacket. She began shaking him, nearly crying, repeating in a breaking voice, Papachuka, you lied about energy? Did you lie, Papachuka? Because we're children? The lady said you were being cowardly. Is being cowardly a bad thing? Silence fell in the open air hall. The professor lifted his head, head looked into his daughter's eyes, put his hand on her little shoulder and said softly, I believe what I said, my daughter. The red-haired child fell silent again. Then she quickly climbed up on the seat and her high child's voice shouted to the hall, My papa is not cowardly. My father believed it. He believed it. The little girl sent her gaze around the new quiet hall. No one looked in their direction. She turned toward her mother, but the young woman had turned away and lowered her head buttoning and unbuttoning the buttons on her jacket sleeve. The little girl again sent her gaze around the silent hall and turned to her father. The professor continued as before to look helplessly at his little daughter. The red-haired girl's voice was heard again in the absolute silence, but now it was kind and not loud. The people don't believe you, Papa Juke. Chushka, they don't believe it because an energy still hasn't appeared on earth that could open the flower's petals like the nice sun. But when it, do, when it does appear, all the people will believe you. When it appears, they will believe you. She straightened her bangs with a quick move it, movement, jumped into the aisle and ran off. When she reached the edge of the open air hall, she headed for one of their nearby houses, ran in the door, and a couple of seconds later appeared in the doorway again. She was holding a pot with some kind of plant on it. She ran with it to the now empty table for the speaker. She put the potted plant on the table, and her child's voice, loud and confident, was heard over the heads of those present. Here is a flower. It has closed its petals. The petals of all the flowers have closed because there is no sun, but they will open soon because there is energy on the earth. I, I am going to turn into energy that will open the flower's petals. The red-haired girl squeezed her little fingers into fists 
and began looking at the flower without blinking. The people sitting in their seats did not talk. Everyone was watching the little girl and the potted plant on the table in front of her. The professor slowly rose from his seat and walked toward his daughter. He walked up to her and took her by the shoulders, trying to lead her away. But the red head jerked her shoulders and whispered, Why don't you help me, Papa Chukka? The professor must have been completely distraught. He remained standing next to his daughter, his hands on her childish shoulders, and he began looking at the flower too. Nothing was happening to the flower. I felt sorry for the red-haired girl and her graying professor. Why did he have to go babbling on with his statements about his belief and an undiscovered energy? All of a sudden, the boy who had given the report stood up in the first row. He turned halfway to the hall, sitting silently, sniffed and walked toward the table. He approached the table with dignity and confidence and stood next to the red-haired girl. He too directed his state at the plant in the clay pot. But of course, as before, nothing was happening to the plant. And then I saw it. I saw children of different ages start standing up from their seats in the hall, one after the another. The children walked toward the table. They stood side by side in silence and looked closely at the flower. Last was a girl of about six, bringing along her very little brother, holding him with her two little hands. They squeezed in front of those standing there. With difficulty and with someone help, she stood her little brother on the chair in front of the table. The little gray, the little, the little guy gazing around at those standing there turned toward the flower and started blowing on it. All of a sudden, the petals of one of the flowers on the plant in the pot began slowly opening, very slowly. But the quieted people in the hall noticed it. Some of them rose silently from their seats. A second flower on the table opened its petals and along with it, a third and a fourth. Hey, the elderly woman who looked like a teacher exclaimed in an ecstatic child's child's voice. And she began to clap. The hall broke out in applause. The handsome young woman who was the professor's wife ran from the hall toward the professor who had stepped aside from the exultant children by the flower and was wiping his temple. She flung her arms, arms around his neck and began kissing his cheeks and lips. The red-haired girl took a step toward her, kissing parents, but the little boy reporter held her back. She jerked her arm away, but after taking a few steps, she turned around, went right up to him, rebuttoned the unbuttoned button on his shirt, smiled and turning quickly, ran to her hugging parents. More and more people from the hall came up to the table. Some picked up their children, some shook the young, young um, speaker's hand. He stood there holding out his hand for shaking and with his second hand pressed a button, just buttoned by the red-haired girl. Someone started playing something halfway between a Russian and gypsy song on the, ba on the bayan. An old woman started tapping his foot on the stage an astonished woman walked out to him like a plump swan. Two young fellows began a rollicking, squatting, squatting dance, and the flower with its open petals turned toward the rollicking Russian dance, which was drawing more and more people with its daring. <laughs>